I'm old, so I, so I can I can take you back all the way to the movements of the 60s and 70s, and I want to do that for a few minutes. The social movements of the 60s and 70s were phenomenal. You can't read, see movies, and understand what was happening. It was a time in which, uh, in my case, black folk uh, were coming out of the civil rights movement. And then we drifted into something called the black consciousness movement. It was a revitalizing time. I think this has been experienced as well by women in the women's movement, gays and lesbians, uh, disability movement. It, you, you felt totally energized. You felt as though you could almost do anything. And sometimes that, that almost adolescent sense of lack of fear caused you to go up against uh, people who were ready to kill you. We felt totally new and rejuvenated. And we tended to express the movement depending upon our, what we would call, what positionality. So if you were a poet, you felt energized to write poetry. If you were a sociologist, you formed with black sociologists and created the Association of Black Sociologists. Economists did the same thing. In my case, we did it with the Association of Black Psychology. Our, our writings, our singing, our music, drama, uh, Barbara Ann Teer in New York, she started the, uh, the Theater in the Black in which we literally had a ceremony in which people would come in and they would throw off their negroness and, and embrace their blackness. Eventually, psychology got into the fray. And over time, we would turn this collective energy as psychologists into a bourgeois analysis. And let's see if, see if I can make that make sense, OK? If you go to the psychological journals, you will see that psychologists are preoccupied, for the most part, with whether or not your identity gives you mental health, makes you feel good, allows you to be happy. Are you with me? Now, we didn't know at the time, but what was happening, we were shifting from a collective emphasis on whether or not we were doing things with the group to help the group to be healthier to an individualistic frame in which the question became whether or not I have high self-esteem. And that's what I mean by becoming very bourgeois, OK? It's not that it's unimportant that you're happy. But the, the social movements were about advocacy, advocacy. In fact, if I had to give my title, uh, talk, a title today, it would be Answering the Call. And so the movements are about answering the call of the folk. And it's not that we were right, certainly we were zealots, but you can't solve a problem unless people kind of come together and wrestle with it. That's what the social movements were about coming together, not necessarily knowing the right answers, but increasing the probability that we would come up with something good because we were all in the same room and we were struggling with it. Over time, the shift became whether or not if you are gay and you come out, are you happy? If you are black, are you happy? I became very frustrated with this because I knew that something else was going on. Among other things, when I would meet uh, and I know you've experienced this too. You know, you're, you're down with your uh, frame of reference. You are struggling with a sense of collectivity. And then you meet the gay Republican, right? Law cabin Republican, OK? Or you listen to a Phyllis Shafley. Or you go to a speech by Clarence Thomas. You're stunned by the fact that you're on, different, you're on different wavelengths. But if you take a deep breath and you actually are honest with yourself, these are very healthy people. These are very psychologically strong people. That's why they're good adversaries, because they have the psychological strength to argue with you, to debate with you, to organize. 
And so that began to be missing in the discourse on identity. How do we explain those persons who are just as healthy as we are, if given we are healthy, <laughs> as a neurotic, I, I'm taking liberties today, okay? <laughs> And so recently, a colleague and I, we went after the most powerful scale that is used to talk about group identity. Uh, and I mean no negativity toward the creator, but Jean Finney is a renowned psychologist, and her scale on ethnicity sets the stage not only for the discussion of ethnic identity, but quite frankly, for any kind of social identity. And over and over and over again, this scale has shown that for those who embrace, who explore their sense of ethnicity, they tend to have high self-esteem. Now, why should I get upset with that? Because they're not explaining those persons who seem to also have high self-esteem, but who don't make being gay, being black, being a woman salient. I want to explain not only those persons who maybe I favor, but as a psychologist, uh, especially as a radical psychologist, I want to be able to explain those persons who, in fact, maybe I don't favor. Are we on the same page? Okay. So, I wondered if low scores, I hate to be technical here, low scores on this scale was masking uh, a version of mental health that was being missed. And sure enough, we discovered the following. There are some people who score low on a group identity scale because they don't like being a member of that group. So let's call that negative salience, okay? But then there are other people who score low on such scales, not because they are hateful or have disaffiliation, but they have something else driving their identity. So they're a member of the group, they are black, they are women, they are gay or whatever, but they don't consider that identity salient and they build up on something other than their social identity. And we did a cluster analysis and we actually showed that negative scores on this test fell into two, two spots. Therefore, there were some people who apparently d didn't like being a member of the group and there are other members who, it was irrelevant. And this is what you struggle with, as most of you, for the most part, are either progressives or you're wannabes. <laughs> okay. Because it turns out that the level of personal mental health, America is such a complex society, it has so many ecological niches in which you can find yourself born into or work in and so on, and these environments uh, support any range of social identities. And so with regard to the issue of personal happiness, and this may bother you a bit, people can either go with the social identity to which they are a member of, or they can do something else. There's no, I won't call it guarantee, Being in the West, personal happiness can be achieved through a myriad of ways. So if that's the case, then, then what's the value in having a social identity? Now let's go back to the social movements. In the social movements, they pull together people from the groups, be you a woman, be you gay, and so on, for the purpose of advocacy, so now you can see that if a group needs to have as many people as possible identifying openly and strongly with their situation, with their cause, with their dilemmas, with their pain, for every person that we don't have in the group, are you with me? The group gets, what, weaker. That is the value of a social identity. Not your own personal well-being necessarily, but if you choose 
to openly identify as Chicano, if you choose to openly identify as gay, if you embrace being a woman, if you embrace being a trans, and you do that with others, then the voice of that cause and that group grows stronger. Even though you as an individual might be as neurotic as hell, okay? <laughs> so there's no guarantees in your engagement with the group that you will personally benefit other than the joy of it. And even for neurotics, you will find that it's, it's joyful being with people who are not necessarily thinking alike, but thinking toward the same goals, who are struggling for the same goals. And this has been lost in contemporary psychology. Uh, I have a new book coming out in December, and I have some articles coming out soon. And I'm, you know, I'm crossing my fingers. I'm hoping I can change the discourse on identity, social identity and psychology. What I'd like to see is for there to be really good measures of group engagement along with measures of social esteem. You with me? So we can show that, hey, if you identify with the group, you may, you may find that also boast, boasting your personal psychology. But more consistently, you will be engaged with the group's activities in its art, in its poetry, in its history, in its struggles. Now, in some ways, under the rubric of diversity, in this case, the summit, we tend to draw people who, who readily identify with their group. Uh, you have to be patient with those persons who don't take your stance. But understand that they're striving for personal happiness in a variety of ways. You're seeing the power in collective. And both are true, because in a sense, I can find strength in either identifying as a black person or I cannot. I can go some other route. I can remember there were various times uh, in my own personal career uh, when R R Rumsfeld, the Republican from the area in which I was born, was almost ready to pluck me and set me on a different path. Uh, I'm sure each of you have had those forks in the road where you either could have stayed where, where you're going now or you could have gone off and maybe made money, not necessarily be happier, but be, be safer, safer to the system. So I'm almost here to ask you to re-embrace with even more vigor the idea of the collective. Not as groupthink, not as uh, ideology in a rigid sense, but if we have a series of problems and we are social beings, we increase the probability of being able to find maybe multiple ways to solve that problem if we come together in that common cause. Whether or not it will make you happy, I don't think is, is relevant necessarily. That's going to be from your lover, from your parents, and, and your kids, at least before, before and after they're teenagers. Jesus Christ, OK? <laughs> <laughs> if you have a teenage child, you're excused from the whole dis discourse. Okay? <laughs> if you have, that's double work, OK? I was at Cornell in black studies, uh, nationally known, and then my daughter showed me, as teenagers do, the different ways that blackness can, can be discussed. So she came in with goth shoes, black fingernails, black lipstick, dyed black hair. I said, honey, that's not the blackness I was talking about. <laughs> but, but she found a way to to, uh, you get the picture, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the social movements were about advocacy, about bringing people together. Uh, I know some people were very ideologic. Uh, that's a, it's always a rough thing, group think. We then drifted, in some cases, as a psychologist, I take partial blame. We then took that 
dynamic and almost uh, pulled the issue of collectivity and group engagement away and made the discourse very bourgeois by asking the question, are you happy? I'm saying to you that you want to be authentic. You want to find pleasure and sometimes pain by struggling with others in the diverse issues that we have, and God knows we have many of them. Uh, it's almost a radical psychology because it turns out that in psychology, if you shift the focus from self-esteem to meaning-making, uh, that throws people off. And that's essentially at the heart of what I'm saying. How do you make meaning of your life, independent of whether or not you were raised uh, in a, in a positive way by your parents, whether or not your attachment was, went well or didn't go well. Do you see the beauty and the power of engagement with other people who are in your same dilemma? Although I don't want to, I, I, I find my inspiration over these years has not just been around problems and around pain. And Lord knows black folks have enough of that. And we celebrate it in the blues. Before I got, before I got this, or before I got the call from uh, Brian this morning, I'm checking out Miles and his his Hannibal and and Hoodoo. It just, I mean, I get that's my source of inspiration every morning. God bless my neighbors when they they hear the the rough beat. In fact, we have discovered that the more you study the culture of the group to which you belong, hear me out, the culture. The more you know their history, the greater the probability you and others will come up with solutions. If you only focus on oppression, then in some ways your oppressor has won. Because from oppression comes defensiveness and reactivity. From culture comes creativity, even in the face of a reactionary situation. That was the other thing about the social movements. It is from those movements that we develop women's studies, black studies, Chicano studies. Chicano studies is not just about pain. Black studies is not just about pain. It's about literature, it's about music, it's about art. And that's the other message of those social movements. Deep, serious study of history and culture, how people have survived over on, on a daily basis, combined with a keen awareness of the various ways in which society can be oppressive. Now, what about intersectionality and uh, am I making light of that? This might be a discussion point for coffee afterwards. Intersectionality and humanism uh, in some ways dilute the emphasis on co the collective. Why? Well, first of all, I. I've always been a human being. I've always been complex. Are you with me? My oppression didn't come from my being a complex human being. It, it was in the hands of people who were powerful, who were able to take some aspect of me being black, okay, and then making that the, the dominant issue in my life. So when, I ha when one has the power, you can take an otherwise complicated person who is multidimensional, and then you can cause the society and the person to focus in on what? Just one or two aspects. That's what oppression is. Racism is the power to oversimplify otherwise complex human beings just on the basis of race. Are you with me? Sexism is the, is the ability to oversimplify the humanity of women who are otherwise complex. So we're always complex. So we're always intersectional. Human, you know, sometimes we think we want to strive to be humanist. Examine what humanism is about. It's simply about saying we are part of the larger arena of humanity. Okay, well, slaves were human, but their condition of inhumanity was not based on whether or not they were human or not. It was based on someone having the power to force them into situations. So I tend to be a little old-fashioned. I'd like to hope have you place a little emphasis on some of who you are. So if you're a woman, I hope you give that 
a little bit more weight than whether or not you have left feet or you're left footed or right handed or whatever, or whether you have blonde hair or green hair or whatever. You are a woman. If you're gay, the same thing applies. There are other things that can describe who you are, but the conditions of gayness, the conditions of, of uh, gender and so on, requires that you maybe spend, I don't know what percentage of your time, 50%, 25%, a disproportionate amount of your time wrestling with that group's issues. So if you, if you make that your focus, that's part of your meaning in life, and you, you have a deep study of the, of the culture and the history of, of your group, and you make it a point to join groups that are struggling with issues, you increase the probability that we will get progress uh, for those groups who are being systematically and have been systematically oppressed. And I'm here to tell you whether or not you're personally happy or not probably doesn't count on whether or not you identify. <laughs> Now, there are ways in which you can be rejuvenated by your group identity. It's, it's, it's really smart to meet with someone who you can have a discussion with about what it means to be a member of your group, right? So having other friends can cause you to be more powerful. There are certain plays and dramas or organizations like this that can cause you to share your ideas. But I've been there and done that, and I can tell you, in your private moments, when your, your demons visit you at 10 o'clock, they won't give a fuck, okay? <laughs> Just, okay. <laughs> There's nothing magical about group identity. It's, it's part and partial of how you survive, but so much counts, uh, is counting on it. Uh, there are the little kids behind you. They don't even know they're labeled yet. And, and your ability to make change, uh, the last year, what's been happening with, uh, uh, with marriage uh, between uh, same-sex persons, that was real, that was struggle, that was strategy. In my own community, uh, the level of poverty is almost as bad now as it was in the 1950s. Uh, brothers and sisters are going nuts uh, with gang activity. Uh, even there, though, I found, because I am so steeped in history, I remember that the St. Valentine's Massacre was committed by almost all whites, where you had Irish gangs and Italian gangs, you with me, shooting each other. In a sense, by my knowledge, I'm not saying I make light of what's going on in Chicago, my hometown, but I'm not surprised by it. When poor people don't have access to meaningful employment, they reinvent themselves through underground economies. Underground e economies are based on very Machiavellian principles. In some cases, you kill someone just to scare the other guy. You with me? Now, I don't like that, but I don't get as upset as some people do, and I certainly don't get into some crazy notion that black men are crazy. No. Interview black men who were in prison, and time and again they will tell you, what was I to do? I wanted to feed my family. I wanted to have some clothes. Once in a while, I wanted some bling. That's the same kind of discourse as the Italians in the 30s, and even Eastern European Jews, who in Detroit had the Purple Gang. In, in a sense, they had people who were hired to kill. We, 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 we wouldn't even associate that with the Jewish community today, and yet that was the case in the 1930s. I find myself personally relieved of almost wanting to blame my group, what, blame the victim for their conditions. And then I have a clearer mind to work with those persons on what are the conditions that create underground economies. And since we know that the, in the long run they don't work, they imprison people, what do we do to solve that? I want to leave some time for Q&A, but those are my basic messages today. Sorry I was late. You, you, you can blame the two brothers in the bathroom, okay. <laughs> okay? I must say, when they came out, they, they came out very spryly. <laughs> okay. I said, well, now you're finished, and let me get, let me get going here. Okay, questions? <laughs> 